So we're, this week we're carrying on with Viking Boy and we're going to be doing newspapers, a whole um, front page of a newspaper this week. So today we're going to recap um, identifying the features of a newspaper. Um, we're going to be looking at the language used in newspapers and we're going to begin to write in the style of a newspaper. Before we do that, let's hear the next chapter. Gunner kept running as long as he dared. At last he slowed down and stepped off the track, groping through the undergrowth until he came to what felt like a huge oak. He curled up between its roots, hugged himself and sobbed. After a while he pulled himself together, wiping his eyes and nose on the sleeve of his tunic. He listened for the sounds of a search, but all he could hear was the wind still sighing in the treetops. He guessed they would come after him as soon as the sun rose and that didn't leave him with much time to work out a plan. Where could he go? What was he going to do? It was hard to think clearly with a mind so full of grief for father and hatred for Scully. Gunnar had never hated anyone before, but now he savoured the feeling, letting its heat flood through his veins. He had sworn an oath of vengeance against Scully, and he was determined to fulfil it, even if he had to go to the ends of the earth and back to do so. That thought hit Gunnar like a blow to the face. No, he wouldn't go to the ends of the earth. He would travel to Valhalla instead and fetch father back. As mother had said, he was just a boy. So how could he take revenge on Scully? A man like that would eat him alive, but he could fulfill his oath by freeing father, who could then kill Scully and save mother. Odin must bring the fallen hero back to life somehow. Otherwise, how could they fight for him? But he had no flying wolf to take him to Valhalla. He didn't even know where it was or if it was possible to get there by any other means. None of the old stories went into that kind of detail. Then he remembered what Brunhild said. You must pray to Odin for anything more. Well, if anyone knew where Valhalla was, it should be Odin, the god who had created it. Gunnar looked up. The sky was beginning to lighten a pale glow seeping into the darkness. He thought quickly. He could pray to Odin here in the forest, of course, but there was a better place. Somewhere he had been for the midwinter ceremony at Yuletide, for the blood sacrifices before the spring planting, for the harvest festival, the temple they called the God House. He rose to his feet, found the track once more and headed into the gloom. By the time the sun had risen fully, he was out of the forest and on the track toward the mountains. After a while, he came to the top of a ridge and walked down into a valley. The track took him through a grove of ancient oak trees, scraps of morning mist clinging to their branches, and then into a broad clearing. He shivered at the sight of the wooden building in front of him. The godhouse had always made him nervous. It looked like a dragon, its walls painted to resemble scales, its entrance a mouth with fangs carved into the curved doorposts a pair of yellow eyes above. And to complete the picture, leading up to the door was a red flagstone path like a fiery tongue. Suddenly, Gunnar heard squawking and he glanced up. Two crows were staring at him from the roof, heads tipped to one side. The sheen of their black feathers reminded him of Brunhild. They squawked again and flapped their wings and hopped about, making Gunnar feel even more uneasy. He frowned at them, took a deep breath, and stepped over the temple's threshold. The wooden floor was smooth, polished by the feet of those who came to worship there. Huge uprights, each one the trunk of an enormous tree held up the roof beams, and every surface was carved with pictures of gods and giants, elves and dwarves, men and strange beasts, scenes from all the old stories. An altar stood at the far end, a flat-topped rock stained with the blood of sacrifices. 
In his mind, Gunnar could see the bleating lamb, the knife flashing and the blood pulsing out, while the people of his steading looked on and chanted prayers. Now some of these people were dead, and the future for the rest was bleak, unless he could do something about it. A prayer on its own might not be enough, not without an offering of some kind, and Gunnar had no lamb or goat to sacrifice on the altar. Other kinds of offering were sometimes made, things that were important to someone or had a value, however small. From his pocket, Gunnar pulled the only thing he had brought with him, father's amulet. It was a simple image of Thor's hammer, carved into black stone, his last link with father and home, with the life Scully had stolen. He laid it on the altar. Hear me, great Odin, he said softly. I beg for your help in the task that lies before me. But most of all, I ask you this. How can I get to Valhalla? Well, the usual way is to die in battle with a sword in your hand, said a quiet, deep voice behind him. But you look a little young for that. Gunnar turned around. An old man stood in the doorway. He was tall, his face powerful and striking. His beard was white, and he wore the clothes of a traveller. A hat with a wide brim that dipped over one eye, a black cloak and tunic, thick trousers and strong boots. He had a bag slung over one shoulder, and he carried a wooden staff. You look tired and hungry too, the old man said. I'd be happy to share with you the food I have. For an instant, Gunnar wondered if he should run, but the old man seemed friendly enough, and the mention of food had made the juices flow in his mouth. He needed to eat, and he needed to rest. So he shrugged, and the old man walked out to the godhouse, beckoning him to follow. A low buyer stood nearby. Gunnar recognised it as the place where beasts were kept tethered before they were sacrificed. The old man ducked inside and set about making a fire with straw and twigs he found in one of the stalls. Soon they were sitting, the fire crackling. The old man pulled cheese and a loaf from his bag and cut chunks with a small bone-handled knife. Gunnar tore into the food, not realising how hungry he was until his stomach started to fill. The old man had taken off his hat, and Gunnar saw that the eye hidden by its brim till then was sightless, a milky white ball like a shiny pebble. The other eye was the palest blue. What brings you to the godhouse this early? said the old man after a while. You look like you've had an interesting night. Gunnar glanced down at himself. He was filthy, his clothes and hands stained with ashes and dried blood, father's blood. Hot tears filled his eyes and he tried to hold them in. What was he doing here with this old man? Thank you for the food, he said and rose to his feet, but I have to leave. What's your hurry? said the old man, throwing more twigs on the fire. I might be able to help you get to Valhalla if you really must go there. Gunnar stared at him. There was something strange about this old man, something that made Gunnar feel uneasy, though he couldn't say why. He sat down once more and crossed his arms. I'm listening, he said. The old man smiled and cut off more bread and cheese, hanging, handing the chunks to Gunnar. You've heard the stories, so you know Valhalla is to be found in Asgard, home of the gods, he said. You'll also know that Asgard is one of the nine worlds, and that all nine are linked by the great tree Yggdrasil. But Asgard itself is joined to this world by the Rainbow Bridge Bifrost. I've heard of that, said Gunnar. How do I find it? Ah, well, that might not be so easy. The yellow flames of the fire were reflected in the old man's solitary eye. Some say one end of Bifrost stands in the land of ice and fire, a whole month's journey across the sea. And then, of course, you'll have to deal with Heimdall, guardian of the bridge. A whole month? Gunnar's heart sank. It hadn't occurred to him that getting to Valhalla would take so long. He tried not to think of what might happen to Mother and the steading in the meantime. But he had no choice. He would have to follow his plan. Where can I find a ship that will take me? There were usually plenty of ships in the harbour at Kaupang. Gunnar had heard that name too, and had the idea it was a big town, but he knew nothing else about the place. 
How do I get there? Is it far? In three days by foot. Maybe more if the weather is bad. Gunnar groaned. But then he found himself yawning. His eyelids seemed to be growing heavy, and his limbs too. He looked at the old man through the skeins of smoke from the fire, and saw he was smiling again. Who are you? Gunnar asked. I don't even know your name. Oh, you'll know it one day, Gunnar, when you fly with the eagle to the land of ice and fire, said the old man. It seemed as if his voice was coming from a great distance. Sleep now. You must sleep. Gunnar lay down, his cheek cushioned on his hands. How did the old man know his name? He was sure he hadn't told him. Gunnar had a feeling the answer might be important, although he couldn't think why. Then a dark wave swept through his mind, filling it with blackness, and he knew no more. He woke with a start, and thought for a moment he was at home, until he sat up and remembered. It was almost dark outside the hut, a white mist creeping across the ground. Gunnar saw that the fire had gone out and he shivered. The old man had vanished, but he had left his bag, and Gunnar opened it. He found more bread and cheese, a flask of ale, a flint and a few silver coins. And right at the bottom was a long grey feather from an eagle's wing. Right, have a think. Five things that have happened in the story so far. You can pause and think about it if you like. Right, here are the five things that I've come up with. One, Gunnar hears Scully, who warns the village about raiders. Two, the wolfmen attack the village, and it turns out Scully is their leader. Three, Bjorn is killed and taken by the Valkyries. Four, Gunnar manages to escape. And five, Gunnar meets an old man in the godhouse who tells him about the land of ice and fire. Right, this week we're going to be planning and writing a copy of Gunnar's village newspaper. We've looked at newspapers before, but this week we're gonna look more at the style of writing in newspapers. So here's a newspaper. Let's have a look what features we can see. So if you'd like, pause the video for a moment, have a look at that newspaper, let's see what we what features we can remember. So up here, we've got what we call the masthead. That's the name of the newspaper, the part that's the same every day. Um, so you're gonna have to think of a name for your newspaper. Underneath that, it's quite hard to see, but we've got the date, um, and the price of the newspaper. Here, we've got a little teaser for a competition that's inside the newspaper. Here we've got some adverts. And then let's look at the main things on here. This bit, the title part in a newspaper, we call that the headline. And then we've got here um, a sort of subheading. First paragraph here, we call the stand first that gives us the main information of the story what you might have here as well although there's not one on this newspaper is a byline which tells you who the newspaper story is written by um, we've got subheadings throughout the article here we've got a picture with a caption we've got another headline here this is in a box interestingly this has got another picture and caption so we've got two stories on this front cover um, and then inside as well some at the bottom sorry some more information about other things that are in that newspaper so there's quite a lot of things that we can include on there which will make it look like um, a proper newspaper so thinking about our story what events of the story so far could have made it into the village newspaper pause the video and have a think and i'll tell you what i came up with 
Right, let's have a look. Raiders attack the village. I mean, this is a big story, so it would definitely be in the newspaper. Scully leads the Wolfmen. So that would have been like a revelation. The newspaper's like revealing things that people didn't know before. So that's quite a revelation. Bjorn is killed. He was the most important man in the village, and now he's dead. So that will probably be in the newspaper. Gunnar escapes. Again, uh, Gunnar, of course, is Bjorn's son. So the fact that he escaped from the raiders will probably make it into the village newspaper. I should just say, obviously, really, in reality, Vikings didn't have newspapers. Newspapers are maybe two, three hundred years old, if that. Um, certainly not in Viking times. But for our English lessons, it's a good thing to do and it's fun. OK. Newspaper writers make use of the three S's when they are writing. They are surprise, suspicion and sensationalism. What do you think they mean? Pause the video and think and then I will tell you what I think they mean. OK. Surprise. Oh, this is they are wanting to surprise the readers. They're wanting to make them read something that they didn't know. Something that's shocking or surprising or makes them go, wow. So that's a surprise. And, and without that, obviously, our newspaper's going to be quite boring. Suspicion. Newspapers can ask questions, can say what they think might be going on. You have to be careful because they're not allowed to tell lies. But they can cast suspicion on people or events. So and people like suspecting things. People like trying to figure things out. And finally, we've got sensationalism. Sensationalism really is um, exaggeration. It's making things seem more interesting than they really are. And um, you get this a lot, especially actually in, in local newspapers, because quite often in a small place, not that much happens. So the newspaper has to try and make that interesting. They can sensationalise the story. We see it in newspapers and magazines and things and websites quite often with celebrities who do quite boring things and then they make it into a great big story. That is sensationalism. You know, famous person seen at shop. Not very exciting, really, but they make an exciting sort of story. So let's have a look at a sentence. Some horses were heard in the distance. This is not a particularly exciting sentence. This is the facts. This is what happened. So how can we use those three S's to make that sound more like something you would read in a newspaper? Let's have a look. The whole village is in shock as the galloping hooves of a hundred horses were heard close to the village boundary. Could these mystery horsemen be our deadly enemies? So where have we used the three S's in here? Well, the whole village is in shock. It's sort of quite sensational. And it's that surprise. A hundred horses, maybe slightly exaggerating there. And then this, could these mystery horsemen be our deadly enemies? This is our suspicion. We're suspecting these horsemen of being the enemies. Gunnar ran to his parents' longhouse. Again. Not very exciting, something that probably happens every day. So how can we make it exciting? Let's have a look. Fleeing for his life. Oh, it says like, it should say life. Fleeing for his life, the terrified tyke tore across the village. Many were left wondering what was happening and what terrible things he had learned. So all this fleeing for his life, terrible things. It's also very surprising and sensationalist. People were left wondering. There's that suspicion again. So we're putting lots of stuff in. It doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't add to the description of what happened, but it does make it feel different. It makes it feel more exciting. So this is what I want you to do. There are four sentences here, and I want you to use those three S's surprise, sensationalism and suspicion to improve these sentences so they sound like they could be from a newspaper. The first one, Gunnar told his parents what he had seen. 
pretty boring. The raiders came to the gates. And Bjorn was killed. I can certainly make that more exciting. No one knows where Gunnar is. Again, pretty boring. So let's use those skills. Think about how I wrote my sentences and see if you can do something like that to make these seem like something from a newspaper. 